Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Akash Kamlesh, and as Vivek sir introduced, I am inside strat as a researcher. Uh, extremely sorry for my voice. I have a bad cold, but uh, yeah, I'll be presenting a mixture of experts today. That is understanding how this concept works and why it works. So let's get started. The agenda for today is we will talk about what mixture of experts is, uh, some background as to why it was even introduced, and do a comparative study of mixture of experts with traditional model training. And we will also understand the working method of a mixture of experts along with Mixtrel. And the code demo is uh, I that it's not feasible to run on a single Collab GPU because of the number of uh, 7 billion models that you would have to run parallelly. But I have the notebooks and I can share them with you. If you have compute resources available, you can definitely run it. So let's start off with the first main question that you would have. Uh, what is the mixture of experts, right? So the mixture of experts is like in the sense of the word itself or is the phrase itself it is a group of different models so it was it's a, it's a very old uh, concept actually it was introduced in 1994 and it was not introduced uh, for nlp specifically it was just introduced as a concept so it was uh, inspired of ensemble learning that was a very popular uh, bootstrapping method of training multiple models together to do the same task or different tasks. So mixture of experts was proposed back in 94. And it's basically talking about splitting a base model into n parallel models. So you, uh, what that means is you have a huge model. And you would split that into n models that are running in parallel. Now, it's, it's more of, you can also think of it as using n models independently together in parallel rather than splitting it both ways are a uh, correct way of understanding so in the in like in the context of a transformer a uh, mixture of experts have two elements so if you are familiar with the transformer architecture you will notice that uh, on the left side here there is uh, an input x going through the self attention layer first and then an add and normalize layer but uh, there's a difference here there's no it's usually a feed forward like layer that's after the add and normalize but here there's something called a switching feed forward neural network so this is actually a variant of mixture of experts called switch transformers which we'll come to in a while but essentially what happens here is that instead of sending the uh, outputs from the normalized layer directly to a feed forward neural network, we would send it to a switching layer, which has a router. So this router, if you see on the right hand side, it outputs a probability distribution as to which expert or which model to send the token to. So it goes at a token level. So you can see x1 and x2 are two different tokens, probably of a sentence, more parameters. So each of them are encoded and are uh, embedded. And after going through the router, they go to different feed forward neural networks. So P is equal to 0.65 or more to go to FFN2. And router, uh, the second token goes to FFN1. FFN2 is nothing but a 7 billion parameter model that's running. So when you say Mixtral 8x7b, you have your FFN1 is one seven B or FFN2 is one more seven B or FFN3 is another seven billion model like that. So after that, you get your output and it's uh, you get your final output and you calculate the loss for each token. Now, uh, this is basically the entire setup that happens. And for every single uh, layer of the transformer block, you do this. So the two components are that there is something called a sparse mixture of expert layer instead of a dense feed forward network layer. You uh, will be talking about this in the next few slides. So MOE layers have a certain number of experts in example eight, in the case of uh, 8x7b. Each expert is a neural network. 
So the thing to understand, remember here is that each expert is still dense. The mixture of expert layer is, is sparse. So yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about that. And the second part is a gating network or a router, which determines which tokens are sent to which expert. So this router is what is determining where to send the tokens. It doesn't send it to like all of the networks. You can choose if you want to send it to two networks as well and make the, maybe take the concatenation of the outputs. But in this case, it goes to one. So coming to the introduction, the scale of a model is one of the most important parameters for better quality. And I think we've seen that when we've compared uh, right from BERT to GPT to GPT-2 to GPT-3. And we've also seen cases where smaller models have performed better, like LAMA 2, 13 billion, et cetera. Those are different, but we're talking about, in general, the scale of a model is an important parameter. So given a fixed computing budget, right, training a larger model for fewer steps is better than training a smaller model for more steps. That is empirically found to be true. A mixture of experts enables models to be trained with far less compute. And the key word here is compute, not time, which because we will be talking about that later. Far less compute is how your mixture of experts benefits you. And dramatically scale up the model or data set size with the same compute budget as a dense model. What that means is it would be like if I had um, you know, if I made a big model that had four, seven billion parameter models in one, in one model itself, it's, they say, they say that scaling up the model with the same compute budget as a dense model is that it would take the same amount of cost to train these four in parallel rather than training it in one single, you know, dense layer, dense model. And the MOE model achieves the same quality as a dense counterpart. I mean, if this is not uh, achieved, then there's no real point of using the mixture of experts, right? You would just rather train a large model rather than splitting into different parts. <clears throat> so the idea was uh, similar to ensemble methods. It was to have a supervised procedure for a system composed of separate networks, each handling a different subset of the training cases. So this is uh, this is basically like a fancier way of saying I have different models tasked to work on different tasks. So trained to work on different tasks, sorry. So like if you had one more, for example, you could have one model for doing, uh, you know, summarization of text. And you could have another model which was specifically trained to handle code, code-based inputs, rather than having one entire model that does both of them. So you would have an expert which, which has been like learned very well on like, you know, understanding code, et cetera. And the other one would be very good at summarization or question answering. So this is essentially what this is, what Mixture of Experts talks about. Each separate network specializes in a different region of the input space. And yeah, so the, again, the main uh, part that determines the weights is the gating network or the router. Now, during training, uh, something to remember is, uh, keep in mind here is that the router along with the experts are trained. So the reason is, um, if you go back here, you see that the router is outputting a probability distribution, right? But how does it know the probability distribution? It can do that only when it's trained along with the models in internally. So when you're training this model, you're training the router along with each of the experts together. So that's a very important point to keep in mind. Coming to why mixture of experts, um, dense networks have large neurons, right? So if you were to take GBT3, for example, of around like I think 165 billion parameters, that's a lot of neurons in like all the weight matrices together. And in that also, whenever you uh, give an input, it's not necessary that the, all the neurons are activated, right? Like there's only a certain subset of neurons that get activated based on your input. This is essentially what MOE bases off. They say that traditional LMs use all neurons in all the matrices for the forward pass. So when you give an input, it goes to the entire model, right? 
and then it comes out, which can significantly slow down inference time because as you scale up, your inference time will reduce. So a smaller set of neurons actually contribute to the output based on your given input. So it's not that, like if I say, give me code, certain neurons get activated than other neurons in the weight matrices, right? So this is why they've uh, mentioned that having a dense network, having large number of neurons is not really a good case for scaling up. And also uh, cloud-based opportunities from a business point of view, it uh, has iterative approaches to corporate strategy. Why? Because you could have like, uh, you know, uh, you could have your business solution, but for different branches of your, you know, your business. So you could have different models trained on different parts of your business and running in parallel. So if you see on the left, this is a very simple uh, diagram of how this would look. So if you have eight different experts, the router would, uh, for this case, is highlighting expert number seven based on the input token that was given to it. Uh, are there any questions as of now? No, I mean, which neurons get activated? Then who who manages that activation? How does that work? So that is uh, basically from training itself. So when you if you take a CNN also, like a normal neural network, when you train it, you are training it using you know forward propagation, back propagation, using some activation functions. So when you're training it, uh, there are uh, the input from one neuron goes to all other neurons. Then after the activation function, certain neurons get more activated, certain neurons don't get activated to the next layer, right? So that is, again, by training itself. That is normal model training. So here in this case, as it's trained, it will understand that the router has to send this token to this expert. And the other experts won't be used at that time. And how that happens, I'll talk about in the next slide. But that's basically like the, it's the same as a normal model training, where when you send an input, it goes to the all the neurons in the first part. Then from there, based on the activation outputs, it goes to the ne a certain neuron in the next layer. Like that. So are you saying the router is the key differentiator? Yes, right? the router is the key differentiator here. OK, because in a normal neural network, uh, uh, different neurons get activated automatically. It, it figures out which neurons exactly. get activated. But here you are saying you are doing a router based management as well. Yes, that is what uh, your normal neural network is nothing but a dense network. Right. Right. So yeah, any other questions? Okay, uh, no questions as of now. Coming to uh, coming to how this uh, how that works is sparsity. So a sparsity sparsity is nothing but having uh, uh, you know a large number of zeros in your in your matrix, right? So if you look at so this is an example of a sparse matrix. You have a lot of zeros and pretty much your diagonal elements and maybe its neighbors are you know numbered. So the sparsity is 74%. Now, how does this help? Think of it as a weight matrix from your dense network, right? If your if your model had such a dense or had such a weight matrix for a particular token, that is. So if you see that the, the, the computation is significantly reduced by so many orders, because if you had a dense a dense matrix, a dense weight matrix, you would have small values in each of the zeros, right? It won't be completely zero. You would have small, uh, you know, like maybe five, two in this case, like five, 10, 15, two, et cetera. So when you pass an input, it goes through every single, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it goes through, it, go, it gets multiplied across every single row and every single column, right? But if you have a sparse matrix, which understands that for a particular input, only these, uh, you know, uh, neurons have to get activated, it saves so much computation because Internally, everything is happening through vectors, right? It's not happening through individual ele element uh, multiplication. So when you do vectorization, it uh, really in uh, increases the uh, inference speed because I would not have to look at the other zeros in the first column or the other zeros in the first row. I would just look at 11 and 22 and say, OK, this is where it has to go. So that is a sparse matrix. And that is what uh, your MOE pretty much deals with. <clears throat> so 
uh, sparsity uses the idea of uh, conditional computation. Conditional computation here is based on the input. So while in dense models, all the parameters are used for all the inputs, sparsity allows us to run only some parts of the whole system based on your input. So this helps in reducing the number of uh, neurons that are being used. And again, this helps in the compute requirement. But to keep in mind, one thing uh, is that this is only during your training and inference times. Because if you were to think about it, this does not reduce your GPU VRAM. It's still a huge matrix, right? Like you still have your matrix. It's just that it's sparse. That's all. So to still load that matrix into memory, you need to have a big GPU. So the idea of conditional computation uh, allows one to scale to the size, scale the size of the model without increasing the computation. Again, as I said before, if you had a big uh, dense uh, weight matrix and you had to do forward pass across that matrix, you would have to multiply or look at the activations across so many different layers before you get your output. Whereas here, it would just like quickly go through each uh, layer because it sees so many zeros are there for it. Okay, coming to uh, root so uh, one, one question on that: yeah. uh, How does that uh, computation understand there are which are zeros that doesn't need to be get multiplied? Right. So uh, essentially, internally, what happens is during vectorization, right? So the model, the input, first looks at the vector that's given to it. So, like in this case, if it were to look at eleven, the first column. It would see that there's uh, 11, that there's a value greater than zero, and it would just go to that point and get itself multiplied there and skip the entire thing after that. So internally, that's how activations work. They get, uh, we usually like give small values to the activations. If, you, if you've noticed, uh, when you train a neural network, the activations aren't completely zero sometimes, right? Because if it becomes zero, that means it's like, uh, it's a dead neuron or you won't get any outputs from it. So this is uh, this is different in that in that sense. All this is saying is that when the router is being trained, uh, it will understand that for that token, it has to go here only, or here only. So that is it's like a penalizing term. Like it says that the others aren't considered at all. So when the input comes, it sees that only this is highlighted for it, and it goes there. And these are these are learned during training. OK, thank you. Yeah. It sounds like a load balancer, right? When we are yes. running a web farm. So exactly. It, it, the load balancer figures out which server can serve the client request. So in this, this case, you're is, adding uh, some kind of a load balancer. It is a load balancer, uh, but we'll also talk about uh, some problems with this kind of load balancing in the few slides after this. Mm -hmm. So what is a router? Um, a router is nothing but a neural network again. It is a network which decides where your token should go at each step. And it does this by outputting a probability distribution. So when I say probability distribution, the term that comes to everyone's mind is softmax, right? So it outputs a probability distribution to decide which expert to send it to, and it is trained along with the expert simultaneously. So this is like an overview. Um, if you have so this is like an overview of your setup there are eight different columns here if you notice separated by those dotted lines and that is your like in this case if you were to consider you could say or uh, take mistral into account let's say you had eight different seven billion parameter models of mistral running and your input is coming to the router here that is your circle the first circle and this circle is saying, OK, this uh, after training, it says that, OK, it has to go to this expert, the seventh one, and then you get an output. Then from there, you do your loss is equal to actual token minus predicted token, and then you're backpropagated. But the difference here is that backpropagation is backpropagation not through just that weight matrix that you saw, but it's also through the input of the router. Why? Because the router also needs to be trained the router needs to understand that for these kind of inputs, it has to go to this uh, this expert, right? Without training the router, it won't really understand or know or learn how to know uh, which expert to send the token to. So your backpropagation is going through um, the expert's neuron itself, 
the model and it's being propagated backwards along with the, uh, with the router. So it's a two-step back propagation here. Yeah, so as I said, it's the gradients are propagated backwards through the MOE weight matrix and the router's weight matrix. The router will learn to send different tokens to experts as they're trained over time. Uh, coming to the benefit, I think there was a message in the chat. Okay, no problem. Yeah, so the coming to the benefit, the same dense weight matrix is maintained, as I mentioned earlier. But during inference time, the router will go pick one of the experts to go through, and you will have one nth of the amount of compute compared to the original LM. Because as I said, you wouldn't have to do the forward pass through the entire matrix of weights, but you would rather just look at one part of it. So you would have one nth of the compute, or you can think of it as n times the throughput. And n here is your number of experts. Uh, so one of the main uh, things that you can relate this to is GPT-4 because there was a lot of uh, speculation saying that uh, GPT-4 is a mixture of expert setup. The reason being, they say that GPT-4 has like a trillion parameters, right? But a trillion parameters doing inference so fast is not really feasible or it doesn't really sound uh, true, too good to be true. So the mixture of expert setup for GPT-4 is not yet confirmed, but it is a very big speculation and it most probably is true. Uh, but they say that uh, having n number of experts, n to 20 billion parameter models running in parallel, due, uh, which have been trained on like maybe different tasks, and the mixture of experts picks it and gives you the uh, inputs. Yeah, Jemmy 1.5 Pro has MOE running. So again, these uh, models, uh, MOE models are done to increase the scale of computation whenever you have a lot of data. And um, yeah, so coming back to the benefit, uh, AI models with the sparsely activated mixture of experts significantly reduce the computational cost of the uh, LLM training. And language models can be decomposed into smaller specialized experts, which focus on distinct aspects of the data. Coming to uh, the training process, it involves training the individual experts and the router. Uh, it, now, the, what, the key word that I said earlier was that the compute is, uh, the, is reduced during training time. But uh, the time is not reduced, sadly. The training time is like, uh, it takes a lot more time to train. And that the reason being, uh, if you have like so many experts lined up in parallel, right? Like, let's say you're scaling up to like 15 experts or 20 experts running in parallel. It has to understand that you have to, first of all, have a larger data set and your router should be so versatile that it can go to the correct expert, right? Because if it goes to the wrong expert, you might just get a weird output at the end of it. So trading a mixture of experts takes a lot of time. And um, yeah, so it's a time intensive process. Apart from training time, there are three other challenges which are present, uh, which is, as Vivek mentioned, that this acts as a load balancer, but there is load imbalance computation as well. And there's also uh, the problem of handling dynamic routing. And there's one more thing called token dropping. We'll talk about all of these now. Um, so solving your, so your load balancer issue is basically this, uh, if I were to like go back to this slide, right? So here, if I had an input and, uh, let's say for some reason, the, the router gets biased. Okay. Let's say it gets biased and it finds that, uh, while training that all the tokens are being sent to this expert or this expert. So it's just constantly sending it to like these two experts most of the time and one or two times to these experts, right? So what you will end up with is a very poorly trained uh, setup of six experts, but two strong experts, which otherwise could have been distributed properly. So you would have two experts essentially in the setup running everything and you'll be wasting a lot of compute here. And um, that is what your uh, load balancing issue is. And there's a way to solve it. Uh, this was what Google had proposed when they had proposed um, switch transformers. Uh, they said that they add some noise, right? So when you are training the model, 
you add noise to the after the router's uh, prediction. So when you add noise, it uh, doesn't zero out certain of the certain experts. Like it doesn't make them zero. It gives them like maybe a twenty percent or thirty percent just because of the noise, right? So when you add, so after the noise, you pick top K instead of picking just one. So top K is essential because, uh, like, if you if you see, why not just select the top expert? It's because if I select just one expert, I don't the model doesn't learn, uh, you know, which why this expert was chosen. So if I were to take two the two experts or three experts, let's say. Based on the probability distribution, it can understand that how far apart these experts were in terms of probability. Like, if was it 0 0.6, 0 0.2, and 0 0.2, or was it 0 0.6, 0 0.4, and 0 0.2? So then it'll understand that you know there is some closeness from this expert to this expert. So this is essentially what uh, the load balancing issue does because it'll help. Uh, preventing uh, you know uh, poorly trained experts at the end of the training process, and along with top K routing. There's one more. Uh, so uh, the load balancing issue comes with uh, one more problem called token dropping, and this is a very serious problem. Uh, you can think of it like this: like if you have a like a classroom, right, and if you have maybe 200 students, and you have like 10 teachers addressing the students' questions, right, for example. And each teacher is specialized in one subject, so like physics, chemistry, or something like that. Now, let's say most of the students' questions are belonging to physics and chemistry. And the other subjects, there are very few students. So what's happening is that the teachers from physics and chemistry are engaging a lot with the students, right? And the other teachers are not uh, you know, engaging a lot with the students. So you can think of it like this as the experts not attending to most of the input. Which is where your data set really matters, the kind of data you're using, the representation of different tasks that you mentioned. And one more important point is like if your teacher, uh, if you have just two teachers for physics and like chemistry, they can only handle like 10 students at a time, right? They can't handle all 200 at a time. What happens to the other students who are waiting in queue? They either like leave because it's taking too long. Or they just go to like another uh, teacher just to see if they can clarify that, right? It's a very normal process, right? All of us do that when we have to wait for a lot of time in a queue. We just leave, or we'll see if we can come back later, right? This is exactly what token dropping is. So when you have a lot of input going to one expert, and if the expert cannot handle that input because it's processing another set of inputs, these tokens get dropped at that current, uh, you know, the the uh, that current stage of input. So, what I mean to say is that, at like let's say at this time step, the inputs have come to this expert, but this expert is busy. These tokens get dropped and are carried forward to the next time step. So again, it goes in like a queue, and it has to make sure that these tokens are learned, right? Otherwise, if the tokens are not learned, then as the time as you keep moving forward, the the importance of those tokens are, is lost because the context is gone. So this is one major problem that uh, used to come with uh, the mixture of expert setup. And um, yeah, so I, I, the expert capacity is like a threshold of how many tokens which can be processed by one expert. And um, it's actually like a formula that's been given, and it's fixed. So when the mixture of experts was implemented, it was a fixed number per expert. Uh, yeah, so why is it important? Because uh, you cannot, you will not know how many tokens will go to each expert ahead of time, right? So you will never know, like, uh, in your, based on your data set, you can't just say that this is going, these many tokens will go to this expert, these many tokens will go to this expert. And we're talking about tokens here, not sentences or paragraphs. Each single token, we can't, we can't say that, right? So, yeah, when, uh, so when we run inference, some experts will be triggered. At the same time, there are shared computations uh, which are applied for all the tokens. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so this is your expert capacity formula. And your hyperparameter here is a capacity factor. So expert capacity is uh, the number of tokens per batch that each uh, expert can handle. The number of tokens each expert can handle divided by the number of experts. So it's, it's sort of like a normalization here that's done multiplied by the capacity factor. So it's usually a number between like 1 to 1.25. 1 
and that number 1 to 1.25 is significant because if i say 1 it means that all the experts have like a very uniform capacity of handling the data but if i say 1.25 then that means that these to these uh, experts have to be ready for some overflow that can happen and in that case instead of sending the tokens to the next time step we send it to another expert itself so that is how this token dropping uh, problem was proposed <clears throat> and was solved by uh, the switch transformers uh, expert capacity is a fixed number of tokens that each expert can be assigned and the extra tokens are dropped if the capacity exceeds so they are not passed to any expert for computation and the model relies on a residual connection to reintroduce it in the next step that's what i said earlier so akash i am a little confused i right. thought uh, the relative positioning or contextual understanding of tokens was key to llm understanding now if you yes. break tokens randomly and put them in separate neural layers they are not uh, being correlated so how will natural language understanding work if the tokens have been segregated or distributed across neurons and no longer working as correlation or a group That's i thought correct. the whole point of transformer was group understanding in with respect correct, to each other yeah, no, no, that's very valid. Uh, but one thing you have to understand is also that um, if if you're um, again, see, it depends on how the model is trained, right? That's why this this setup is very uh, sensitive, I would say, because if you're if you if it's trained well, then what will happen is for a given sentence, it'll understand, it'll it'll look at the end, it'll look at the entire sentence and then send it to the same expert. So it will still build some context because there are the attention mechanisms and the embedding layers before it goes to the MOE, right? So each token is processed before that in the normal way, like a normal transformer. The only difference here is that if you're, if it's trained well, if the router is trained well, based on the previous outputs that is from the encoding and embedding layers, it understands the context of that sentence and sends all the tokens that are related to it in, to the correct expert. So it's not just the MOE that's doing it on its own. There is information from the encoder and the embeddings. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Vishal has a question, I think. Yeah, Vishal. Yes. Uh, Akash, help me understand one thing. Uh, when we are when we are seeing that number of token when you're exceeding, right? Yeah. And we are passing that number of token to other expert. But we discussed already about this. The expert is trained for other tasks. Let's for Correct. suppose one expert is trained on summarization, other expert is trained on for suppose scoring, right? Sentiment scoring. Right, right. Right. When you're passing this extra token, so this complete context will change, right? Because other tokens which have been passed to the other expert now, that will result a not a very clear understanding on the model, right? Help me understand this part. No? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll clarify that. So this uh, method that I, that was talked about, right? So I told you there's two ways of doing it. One is drop it and then propagate it to the next time step. But that was shown to be very bad. So here what happens is that it's using top K routing in this situation. So you would have like, let's say, for example, you're given like a sentence, right? You're giving two tokens, you're giving tokens one at a time. <clears throat> and let's say uh, like eight out of 10 tokens went to the correct expert. But then now that exceed that because that field is capacity. So what happens is you send these two to the expert, which is like the second highest in the probability distribution, right? So you send it to that expert. And then in the end, you'll take a combined sum, a weighted sum of the outputs from both the experts, if you understand what I mean. So your uh, your context is maintained based on expert one, along with the expert two output. Obviously, there's going to be a slum loss in accuracy because, as you mentioned, expert two is meant for a different task. But to maintain the fact that the tokens are processed and then combined later with the output of the first expert. So after that, again, it goes through its embedding layers, right, and its decoding step. So that at that time, the context is uh, re, uh, rebuilt into the sentence. So the MOE part here is the, so this entire token dropping uh, problem here was just so that it gets accommodated and it doesn't get dropped from the sentence at completely. I hope you understood now. Yes, I understood that particular point. Uh, one follow-up question on this, uh, Akash. For suppose, uh, when we set the probability distribution function, right, which assign the probability to each expert, 
and there yeah. is expert capacity also uh, associated with that right so when a prompt comes uh, on a specific task comes so the pd function will take care of like where to assign this which expert yeah. to assign that right but yeah. then how the expert capacity is decided do we that is decided based on the frequency of the prompt which are coming from the users or like because this are actually correlated right with each other now yes 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 right. yes so uh, yeah so like this is where your uh, the data set matters also like if you have a very skewed data set which has one kind of task like one kind of instruction for example then that expert will be like again as i said will be learned more but the solve but then that's not necessarily a problem because you know, let's say if you have if you have two experts then it might be a problem like if you have two tasks and you have two experts there'll be a problem because it's just one is to one right but if you had like four experts let's say what will happen is the experts itself aren't configured to run as uh, like this task or this task beforehand itself so you could you could configure them as and say that this expert is meant for this but internally it might learn something else differently so what can happen is that out of four it sees that one is full and initially in the training like in initial training stages it might have uh, you know it'll send the data to another expert and that expert might become uh, complementary with your first expert so like let me break that down if you have two tasks and you have four experts and you initially thought that one expert would uh, be able to handle it but it doesn't then it will just pick another expert and learn that expert for this task again so you would have two experts performing the same task in that case so that's how it scales up to different experts uh if you if, are, if you are able to understand that oh okay, yeah thank you very much yeah so essentially it's a kind of a servant master paradigm right or parent teacher paradigm parent child paradigm it, it it's it, like it's a different. student uh, teacher uh, paradigm parent yeah. so teacher is learning what students can do the task best so redirect yes. that task to that student right no redirect uh, that student to that teacher sir that is the router hmm? redirect the student to that particular teacher that's what it's doing Oh, no, I mean, uh, the teacher will direct the task to the student as per the expertise of the students. Ah, OK, like that. Yeah, OK. Yeah. yeah. So we have seen this, uh, you know, teacher-student paradigm uh, in many AI algorithms over the years. So it's uh, so somewhat similar to that, right? So yeah. OK. <clears throat> so yeah, and uh, again, um, coming back to that, the capacity factor is an important uh, hyperparameter here in that case. So you would ideally want it to be somewhere near 1.25 or 1 to 1.25. Uh, exceeding 1.25 would create like, again, sparsity in terms of each expert, which is not good because you would have a very sparse expert uh, learned. Very huge expert with uh, very sparse representations. So one more thing is, um, the last point, uh, there can be cases where the expert is not assigned enough tokens to fill the capacity itself. So like uh, this is again like uh, uh, if your uh, data is not uh, like there's not a lot of tokens going to one expert, then it's uh, what happens is the rest of the tokens are just padded. So just to just to maintain uniformity of the shapes internally when pro when uh, giving out the outputs. So you wouldn't have, you would all have, you would have outputs of the same uh, sizes. Okay, so yeah, this is again like a revision to the gating method. Um, one method is uh, the softmax, simple softmax that you would use for routing. So this is for how you would route the tokens basically. So if you have a simple softmax, you get a probability distribution and you could choose the router. But as I mentioned, uh, these kind of situations will create bias towards learning to specific experts only. So what you would do is something called noisy top K gating, which is what I explained. You add noise and then you take the top K. So that the expert is like the ex the router also understands why which why each expert is getting the token. So this is the revisiting the bias towards the expert towards experts. Uh, tokens can get strongly assigned to few experts, leaving out other experts. This is a big problem because you'll end up with a very strong model with small number of weights compared to a strong model that uses the benefit of all the experts.
So the two methods that could be done to solve it is the first one is using the randomness, that is using the noise. Uh, because if you use the noise, what will happen is, um, if you look at the diagram on the left side, you see that the expert choice is like a one-hot encoded vector, right? It's saying that very strongly it's predicting that it has to go to expert seven. But when you add some noise, it will normalize that distribution a bit and make it 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and 0 0.4 towards expert seven at the end of the day. So it won't strongly assign the token to that particular expert. The other method that's not uh, that that sounds good but is not in done in practice is adding a penalty for the wrong router choice so what what you could do here is like if see, if i were to add noise right by mistake uh, the noise might have you know uh, like it, it could be like a 0 0.51 0 0.49 situation that could occur so 0 0.51 predict the wrong expert when it should have gone to the 0 0.49 expert just because of the noise that was added so in that case, what's happening is it's learning wrong, right? It's technically learning wrong. But um, so in that case, what they do is that you can have this modified loss function, which does uh, actual minus predicted tokens along with a penalty for the wrong router choice. So this is a very supervised way of saying that, you know, like uh, internally it has to go to this router only, but it's not done in practice because uh, the router itself doesn't know which token, which expert to go to. So. It's a, it's a theoretical concept. Coming to some uh, uh, parameters. Oh, wait, before I talk about this, I wanted to talk about token dropping once more. One more point. Um, sometimes what happens is that in while training mixture of experts, people consider token dropping as a form of regularization. So how, because it's like, uh, it's like a dropout. It works as a dropout here where some tokens are randomly dropped and like you could uh, make your uh, expert robust in trying to predict it. That is one uh, concept that they proposed, a Google DeepMind has proposed, but it again depends on how many tokens are dropped because if out of, if 60% of your tokens are dropped, it's, it's, it's uh, not helping your case. So memory requirements, um, as I said, your GPU requirements will be the same that is uh, for loading the base model into memory. So if you were to use Mixtral, uh, by base model, what I mean here is not 7 billion parameters. It is 8x7b. And also one more thing to uh, keep in mind is um, when I say 8x7b, it does not mean 56 billion parameters. Why? Because as I said, uh, certain parameters are shared across all the layers, right? So those are your attention and your embedding layers. Those shared parameters don't contribute to the increase, right? The only increase here is your MOE. So that is why you would end up with not 56 billion, but approximately 44 billion parameters. So the VRAM requirements will be like, uh, it, you would need to have enough to load around 44 GB into memory. Then uh, that is just for loading the model. Training it is another uh, whole uh, case. So you would need uh, at, at uh, minimum 80 GB of GPU just to train a mixture of experts. Uh, the two methods of training that this, is adding noise. Yeah, yeah this Mixtral is from Mistral AI, right, of France. Yes, so, yes. So they call their LLM as Mixtral. So they always had this, uh, you know, uh, mixture of expert uh, from version one of Mistral LLM, or it was a recent phenomenon. And is Mistral AI the creator of uh, you know, a mixture of experts? No, uh, they are not the creator of mixture of experts. They have used mixture of experts for their uh, mixtral model. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so they've used a MOE concept for mixtral. I said in the beginning that uh, mixture of experts is a very old concept, actually. It's not okay. Uh, okay. very, it's not a new concept. It has been done only for LLMs uh, very recently. Yeah, Mistral 8x7b was published in January actually by Mistral AI, right? So right. Very new. It's a uh, it's a it's a new space that is being explored for uh, LLMs, but mm -hmm. uh, the there's some other work also been done that is switch transformers that has been shown to solve those problems that MOE presents, like all those token dropping and dynamic load balancing, etc. So yeah, uh, 
yeah so you need to have uh, enough vram to hold a 47 billion model and uh, the two methods of training which is adding noise to the router and penalizing the router is an extra overhead for training training it increases training time and computation is reduced only during inference because it does not go through the entire weight matrix it goes through just one expert and that's like one eighth right so the computation is just reduced that time so i guess that mean when we are using the model right like for suppose a fine tuned model of mo if you are using in practice so that right. will be, that not be so intensive uh it will not be intensive when you are inferencing when you are doing inferencing on it so yeah, when you are like asking questions to it it will be fast it won't be compute in intensive but okay. you will need enough uh, gpu to load the model at least mm -hmm. okay so okay. yeah you would have, you would need at least like uh, you know maybe a 50 gb gpu to load it and another uh, maybe 3 4 gb just to like do inferencing okay Oh. yeah so when do you implement moe when you have uh, from a business point of view you would do this when you are a very large business and you have a high volume of requests which represent a wide variety of tasks so if uh, you could do this like for the public or you could do it internally in your business as well so like if you have a very huge company with different uh, departments with different departments doing different tasks right like you have a different you have different databases for different uh, departments right so if you if your team if you wanted like different models for your team to work on uh connected with each other you could use a mixture of expert setup there and when you have large data sets and targeted to solving different problems then you want uh, more throughput and when you get faster inference speeds and when the main uh, point here is that you have massively large language models to scale up to trillions of parameters uh i think the last point of discussion is uh, switch transformers uh switch transformers is a relatively newer concept that has come out by google and they they've, they've uh, taken a step beyond moes and have built upon their said that the moes uh, struggle with training and fine tuning instabilities and uh, they dive deep into these topics and suggest improvements so contrary to the idea of using at least two experts switch transformers uses a simplified single expert strategy and the effects are uh, the router computation is reduced the batch size can be halved and communication costs are reduced quality is preserved so how this does it is uh, we'll talk about it now in in a, in a very overview fashion uh yeah so parallelism switch transformers is based off parallelism uh moes were based off sparsity right that was like a very introductory uh, that was a very big thing for moes so along with sparsity there's something called parallelism parallelism is that when you have uh, different parts of your setup in different uh, uh you know machines running together so it's like a distributed setup here so you there's different kinds of parallelism that is data parallelism model parallelism and model and data and expert parallelism so expert parallelism was what switch transformers uh, has uh, introduced the others used to be there uh, before as well so if you see uh, this parallelism talks about like data the data parallelism is saying that the same weights are replicated across all the cores and data is partitioned across those cores so if you it will it'll make a lot of sense here if you look at it this way uh data parallelism think of it as uh, each square as one machine right one gpu so if you have 16 different uh, gpus or 16 different cores your data parallelism the first diagram is talking about how each uh you know like each uh, block is each uh, uh, expert so each expert is receiving the same data and let's say you had one uh, data point here and you pass that to each expert and that goes only to these four experts let's say due to the top k routing what happens is that when you're back propagating and you're learning and you're training uh, it has to go through here and come back through each of these four so each data point is sent to each of those four uh, models and you have to learn a combined representation of uh, all of them 
so this is uh, like data parallelism. Model parallelism is basically saying that you have different parts of the model distributed across different, uh, uh, you know, the the setup, the cores here, and you can do a mix of both. That is model and data parallelism. Uh, it would it would give you different parts of the uh, data to different parts of the uh, model here, and then you would combine them and have a learned representation. So this is there's a lot of like permutations here to talk about but the main thing is uh, expert and data parallelism here expert and data parallelism is uh, these individual like squares you see are different experts <clears throat> and that's why they're in different colors because each color is doing a different task so each of these experts will receive uh, the the desired data so the blue color data point would come to blue the green color data point would come to green etc and this is what helps inter, uh, increase the, um, the reduce the computational requirements by a large margin, along with increasing the training, uh, decreasing the training time. There's another extreme called expert model and data parallelism. However, this uh, this sort of uh, paradigm is not uh, explored and done practically because it's too much of uh, distribution. You're distributing the experts' weights. You're distributing the model across different cores. And you're distributing the data points across each. Uh, you're sharding the data. You're sharding the data to each part of the model separately. So, propagating you have to propagate through each part of the model, uh, along with each part of the data, along with each part of the expert. So that increases the, the training time exponentially. However, it does lead to very high parallelism. So, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Oh. Yeah, that last slide was quite interesting. Nice. <laughs> it yeah, shows uh, uh, how the parallelism concept works mm -hmm. in very various uh, combinations or permutations. Yes, and uh, different these uh, methods have been done like they're they're in practice also. How you run a distributed LLM training setup, etc. But uh, the expert in data parallelism was what uh, switch transformers had proposed, and but, it does. Uh, what uh, Akash? What about the quantization or uh, you know model compression techniques? So they were also achieving you know LLM uh, fast performance, right? So quantization or... is uh, it's it's doable, but I mean there's nothing wrong stopping you from quantizing your models and doing it. It's just that uh, this setup is talking about if you were to use the original weights without any quantization. Mm -hmm. And you can't train a quantized model directly. Uh, you need to add some trainable parameters to it, which is why you so have like LoRa. We have a, a fine tuning with QLoRa, quantized LoRa, right? So, yeah. uh, so those were also uh, model uh, you know, optimization or compression techniques. Yes, yes. It was also achieving model performance improvement. So yes. they are all trying to achieve similar goals, I guess. Yes, they are all uh, basically trying to reduce the compute required during training. But mm -hmm. uh, this one does it in a very different way. So it mm -hmm. uh, targets the expert directly. Rather than your, it to... your research suggests this is state of the art for new LLM versions like GPT-4 or Mistral LLM. It's uh, not, I wouldn't say state of the art because uh, it comes with a lot of trade-offs. It comes mm -hmm. with a lot of trade-offs, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But the only reason you would use it is when you want to scale up to a very, very huge setup. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that uh, everybody would do on a daily basis. It's just a research uh, concept or a very huge organization would try to experiment with this. Right. So, yeah. How does this uh, this method? I know this is mainly for training. When you go into the inference, where right. the data get validated now, yeah, is, is it really working or not? And yeah. is there any mechanism in the inference where we are not finding these? Uh, you know, the results are not matching and all that to hold back to uh, you know do the training again or do something on this MOE. Like you know, you do get the MOE for uh, in uh, for the training and get all the coefficients or parameters, and you go into inference, and then you started failing, you know, drastically. Is there any mechanism to go go fall back and uh, any anything like that in the research? Um, fall back is not really 
done i don't think it's a, it's a concept either mm-hmm. the only thing you can do is to ensure i mean while training you ensure that you are evaluating the model also and at different time steps so you keep evaluating the model at every like you know x steps so you can see that the model is performing correctly or not because uh, yeah and then the other thing is uh, making sure you do your token dropping and load imbalancing properly so those two steps should uh, be able to handle your problems and one more solution you can implement is not just using one router you can use multiple routers if your uh, setup is so big so that multiple routers can learn better it's like having multiple attention heads right multiple attention heads attend different parts of the input so here multiple routers would also understand you know why the token should go to uh, no it's more like this router can understand that this token goes to this expert but the other router will say it goes to go to that expert but there's like another router which will decide which router to go to as well so that that's called hierarchical mixture of experts and uh, again that's only in research it's not implemented yet i see but I... Uh, your question of fallback is uh, it's not been uh, done yet in fact that's true for any model training right like there's no real fallback mechanism you have to correct the training process and train again yeah i was thinking about this you know nowadays enterprise llms are coming in in corporations where you know they are training on their own data and smaller ones and uh, you know how you know that's kind of moe in that sense you know they are more focusing on specific work and uh, those kind of thing in the training side but as they increase the data and uh, come back so it looks like they had to come back with full training again uh, occasionally right. and redo those uh, that's only way, yeah yeah makes sense thanks okay uh i have a quick question i'm sorry i'm not able to raise my hand here okay can you hear me yes i can hear you yeah uh so uh, a great great uh, overview akash really you know for non experts like me this is very useful <laughs> uh, i yeah. i want to you know i always like to draw an analogy to a real world situation and so maybe if you can help me out you know in google maps Yeah. When you model a long distance let's say you're going from bangalore to chennai you know okay. generally a 5 to 6 hour uh, drive and right. it gives you the prediction of the drive time based on the status as of that time yes right now if i take your example here uh, could we think of you know so ideally it sh- there should be a Uh, a drive time prediction model for every let's say 1 hour slot by okay. using your analogy could you say that every <laughs> square every colored square that you were showing could be right. thought in terms of a 1 hour model and you know okay. when you want to do the overall drive time you're going to aggregate let's say 6 1 hour models to get to that point okay but um, no i understood your question and i understand that but here in that case you are uh, you would not be doing it this way you would be using a sequence to sequence uh, pipeline so this is a this is a uh, like there's different ways of training it there's something called causal language modeling that is how you train models normally when the sequence of data is not very important but in your case when you're saying the sequence matters so you consider the last 6 uh hours right last six uh, machines so that is where your uh, sequence to sequence pipeline will matter it is doable and you could do it but you would have to change your pipeline to sequence to sequence and ensure that the weights are being carried forward at every part okay thank you so it's it's kind of it's uh, it's it sort of makes sense but i don't see it being used uh, for that kind of a situation that is uh, like an entirely different uh, like problem what you said it wouldn't be a mixture of expert setup because a mixture of expert setup would treat each expert at the same time right it wouldn't look at one expert for the sar only okay understood thank you yeah uh, any other questions Yes, sir. Uh, I think there's no questions for today.
<laughs> so uh, you said you have some inference demo or no demo today? I uh, I don't have the inference demo sadly, uh, but I can share two collab notebooks which talk mm -hmm. about how you can train a switch transformers model mm -hmm. on your data. The other one is using uh, uh, the other uh, model. I mean, the other notebook is uh, trying to implement uh, just to inference the switch transformers on a GPU. So if you have a large GPU, you can go ahead and use that notebook, mm -hmm. and it will be able to. You can talk to Mixtra Latex Seven B directly. And there's also a website that has the hosted Mixtra Latex 7B. Uh, if you want, you can talk to that as well. It's a it's a it's a demo uh, model. It's not okay. yet uh, to be used in production. But is if Mixtra, you just want to try, 7B is it available in Hugging Face or AWS Bedrock? I think it's there on Bedrock. I'm not sure, but it's there on Hugging Face. I'm not sure okay. about uh, AWS Bedrock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Please share those notebook links. You can put it in our AI Lab WhatsApp group uh, yeah, for all members to access. I it. can uh, send it here as well. If sure. You sure. Yes, I'm just uh, sending it in a second. So excellent presentation, folks. If you want to join our AI Lab, reach out to me. I've shared my number in the uh, message here. Uh, we are an AI uh, community uh, driven company and we collaborate on research and development. We do uh, you know, foreign projects in Gen AI and we are also making our Moonshot Gen AI product. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you're interested in collaborating. So any final questions for uh, Akash here? Uh, you can see that we have some remarkable experts like Akash in our community. So it would be good to collaborate. Uh, yeah, Hari, you have raised your hand. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Akash and Vivek. Hello. Uh, I'd like to, uh, my doubt or a question is that, is there any real world application currently uh, emerged or uh, came? Like based on this mixture of experts, which they can able to benefit if any other organization is there any application that came up right now there's a uh, an uh, implementation by an open source community it's called open moe and that is uh, meant for handling uh, again it's an open source initiative that was based on switch transformers to uh, you know just for, just from a proof of concept perspective but uh, as a company if you're asking me which company uses it uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, that's something I would have to look at. But internally, GPT-4 and Gemini do use mixture of experts because they say that uh, these models have trillion parameters and like it's absurd, right? You can't think of trillion parameter models running parallelly unless there is some mechanism like this. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, yeah. Thanks for that. So GPT-4 has not announced explicitly they are using mixture of experts, right, Akash? No, 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 they haven't uh, explicitly announced it. Unlike Mistral, which has said it is a mixture of experts, right? Their new model, Mistral. Yeah, they haven't uh, explicitly said that. No, I was just Googling. I found that that it, 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 it says that the Mistral is, uh, 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 you know, mixture of experts model. Yes. Yeah. So Mistral is not hiding that basically. Mistral is uh, Mistral is more towards open sourcing rather than and research rather than commercializing because OpenAI has gone the commercializing route. Mm -hmm. What yeah. about Llama? So is Llama also getting into mixture of experts, or you don't see that? We're not too sure, but uh, there is a lot of uh, so there's something very interesting about Llama that. They have reserved uh, at least, I think, hundred or thousand or ten thousand H hundreds, NVIDIA H hundreds. So NVIDIA H hundreds are like the best GPUs in the world, and they have reserved uh, ten thousand or twenty thousand of them already. So you won't find them anywhere, and I think that's because they're training Llama three that's coming up. Yeah, I believe the uh, Facebook has a big deal with uh, with the NVIDIA. Yeah, um, yeah. For Llama research, yes. 
Yeah, I think you are right. About 10,000 plus uh, part of it, they were working on it. Uh, but I think to look at all of these, you know, as it goes beyond these you know, few large people with trillions of dollars, you know, they will have to come to some of these model eventually. And that will be the, you know, uh, sweet spot for many corporations to go beyond it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, I think uh, Lama is just like, because Lama 2 was released quite some time and they have been silent. So they are uh, now releasing Lama 3. It might be, again, a mixture of expert setup, but no one's sure yet. Mm -hmm. OK, any other questions, friends? OK, with that, we come to the end of this. Thanks a lot, Akash. Uh, fantastic presentation, as always. And always excited to see and kind of look forward to whenever we announce your webinar, because your content is always marvelous. Uh, thank you, audience, for joining. Uh, and uh, do reach out to us if you want to collaborate with us. Thanks a lot, Akash. Thank you, audience. Thank Have you. a good rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.